Welcome to Calvary Church with Skip Heitzig. We're so glad you've joined us today. In Paul's letter to the Colossians, he declares that Jesus holds everything together, from the majestic to the microscopic and everything in between, work and family, friendships and faith. In this series, Pastor Skip explores the practical application of Jesus' preeminence so we can make sure that Jesus is at the center of it all. Always only Jesus, I feel like I should have worn a hat for some reason, so I can be like you guys. Boy, that sounded really, really good. Uh, would you turn in your Bibles, please, to the book of Colossians, chapter 2 this morning. Great to see you. Hey, I've heard that this is the best service of all the services. I just heard that from somebody. I think they come to this service, actually, who told that to me, but just don't tell the other services that, that uh, you are. Uh, Colossians chapter 2. So, uh, I brought this with me. No, my name is not Mike Lindell. <laughs> but this is my pillow. Um, all of us have one of these, I'm guessing. Not all of us have a good relationship with this. Uh, some people get up at night. Some people find it hard falling asleep. There's a thing called sleep deprivation. If you've ever had that and tried to function during the day, <laughs> you know how difficult uh, that can be. A couple of true stories. Uh, one man said, I once spent five minutes searching desperately for my cell phone. This is a guy who didn't get enough sleep. I spent five minutes searching desperately for my cell phone, complaining the whole time about it being missing to my wife, who I was talking to on my cell phone. <laughs> this went on until she timidly asked, are you using your cell phone right now? It was such an out-of-body experience that I just hung up. <laughs> um, here's another man who didn't get enough sleep. He admitted this. He said, many years ago, I had to do a presentation and when I got to the meeting and opened up my briefcase, I realized that I had been carrying a backgammon board all morning. Not his briefcase. He was there to play a game. So if you have trouble with this, if you have trouble sleeping, you're not alone. Between 50 and 70 million Americans uh, find it difficult to have some kind of sleep disorder uh, for a variety of reasons. Sometimes those reasons are physiological reasons. It could be they had too much caffeine. It could be that they have uh, uh, physical pain, and it's hard to fall asleep when you're in pain. Uh, it could be that um, they have a breathing problem, like sleep apnea. And then other times, it's an environmental reason. You're too uh, cold, you're too hot, there's too much light in the room, your husband or wife is snoring or moving, and you find yourself affected by that. Sometimes uh, people go to sleep, but they can't sleep because they are dealing with things emotionally. Uh, so for instance, they have anxiety about the future, or they're replaying the past events of that day, uh, or they are angry at somebody. It's unresolved anger. They just keep stewing it. Uh, stewing in it over and over again in their minds. Or they have a guilty conscience. Guilty conscience will give you a bad relationship with one of these. Um, strained relationships, depression, all of these things will keep you up or get you up at night. Now, I've given this message the title, What Keeps an Apostle Up at Night? Not to suggest that Paul the Apostle had trouble sleeping. I don't believe necessarily that he did, but I say that as an expression because something is bothering him. Paul the Apostle is, is greatly concerned about 
uh, an issue. In fact, if you look in verse 1 of chapter... I'm not going to hold this pillow the whole time. So uh, if you look at uh, verse 1, notice what he, he, how he begins this chapter. I want you to know what a great conflict I have for you and those in Laodicea and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh. Conflict, struggle, agony. Uh, it means an intense strain. Paul is bothered about something. Something's keeping him up at night. Uh, this is not unusual if you know the writings of Paul. Remember when he gave that little list or that rather long list of all the things he has suffered as an apostle, 2 Corinthians 11, perils of robbers, perils in the seas, uh, have rocks thrown at me, etc., etc. He ends by saying, beside the other things, what comes on me daily, my deep concern for all the churches. So what you are about to read is that concern for this church. Chapter 2, again, verse 1, I want you to know what great conflict I have for you and those in Laodicea, for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts may be encouraged being knit together in love and attaining to all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now this I say, lest anyone should deceive you with persuasive words. For though I am absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted, built up in him, established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. All right, a couple of things. Number one, Paul never met this group. He didn't start this church. We think Epaphras started this church. Epaphras went to Paul. Paul's in prison in Rome. He hears what's going on, and it bothered him enough, conflict he talks about, it bothered him enough to write this letter. And what is bothering him, what is keeping him up at night, is there's these new ideas infiltrating the church at Colossae and at Laodicea, Little thoughts, new ideas, novel, fresh ideas about Jesus. So Paul's concern is that these teachers are so good at what they do, so persuasive that the church is going to be swayed by it. So Paul is very vulnerable here when he says, that bothers me. That keeps me up at night. Mark Twain once said, a lie can make its way halfway around the world while truth is still lacing up its boots. Um, it's true. It's true that falsehood travels quickly, lies travel quickly, gossip travels quickly, truth makes progress sometimes at a snail's pace. Well, we have 10 verses that I want to take you through. I just read them to you. Uh, true confession, when I originally outlined this paragraph, I had like six or seven points to bring you, and I thought, no, I, I got to try harder. So uh, I, I discovered that I could boil it all down to three words, three basic concerns, and I'll state them in, in just single words. Three basic concerns of Paul, believe, behave, beware. Believe, I want you to know something. You got to know it, understand it, believe it. Behave, not just know, you must grow in that. You got to grow in your lifestyle. And then the third one, beware. Be slow to entertain other people's bad opinions about Jesus. So 
So these three words, believe, behave, beware. Let's take um, each one, one at a time. First of all, believe. Now listen, Paul's first concern for them is that they believe the right things about Jesus, that they have an understanding and a knowledge. In fact, in verse 2, he uses those two words, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, and attaining to all the riches of the full assurance of understanding to the knowledge of the mystery of God. That's his basic concern, is that they have the right knowledge and understanding which will affect their love in that church. Now, I'm going to have you look at a word in verse 2, the third word in, hearts, that their hearts may be encouraged. Here in the West, here in our modern Western culture, we speak of the heart once we get past the fact that it's the vital organ of the body. Um, We usually talk about the heart as the place where we feel things, your emotions, the seat of your emotions. And we Christians even do this. We'll say things like, it's not about head knowledge, it's about heart knowledge, right? You've heard that before. It's not that you know things in your head, you got to know things in your heart. And we often set up a false dichotomy of your heart versus your head. That's a very unhealthy paradigm to set up. Because from a biblical perspective, in ancient Near Eastern biblical perspective, the heart was the mind. They're synonymous with each other. Uh, It says in Proverbs 23, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So it's the place where you process your thoughts. It is the seat of your will. It is the place you understand or don't understand things. That is your heart. So we might talk about the heart, but this is the biblical heart, the mind, the will, the understanding. So what Paul is saying in these first five verses is this. Look, I'm really concerned that you guys have doubts in your mind as to who Jesus Christ really is. And those doubts about Jesus are going to disrupt your unity, or what he calls being knit together in love. Also, there's an overarching emphasis in this entire paragraph, and that is the emphasis of contrast between Jesus Christ and human philosophy. Look at verse 8. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. So I want you to know, believe, understand in your heart. There's these philosophies out there that are against what you know to be true, what you have been taught is true. And... Those philosophies are spread by persuasive words. Again, look at verse 4. This I say, lest anyone should deceive you with pervasive words. Now, I'm drawing your attention to all this because I want you, want you to see all of these things are mental activities. Mental activities. They need to understand who Jesus is, that he's the creator, the sustainer, the head of the church, the reconciler of humanity. Now he adds a couple more, the repository of all wisdom and all knowledge. And, by the way, in Jesus is all of the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So Paul is setting out the truth of who Jesus is as opposed to false philosophies. They need to believe. They need to know. All right. What you believe about Jesus is the most important thing about you. That's what A.W. Tozer once said. He said, what a person believes about God is the most important thing about that person. I'll take it a step further. What you believe about Jesus Christ is the most important thing about you. All of us are theologians. You might think, well, I'm not a theologian. I don't do theology. Actually, you do. You have some opinion as to who God is. Everybody does. 
You can't avoid being a theologian. The question is, are you a good one or a bad one? So the more you know and understand the truth, the more you will be able to detect error. The more you are able to detect error, you will be able to stand up against those who promote error. That's verse 5. Though I am absent in the flesh, I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your, notice this, good order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. Those happen to be military terms. Good order, steadfastness. It speaks about soldiers who stand in formation and make a solid, united front, standing together for the truth. So knowing the truth will keep you standing strong and help you stay together. I'm going to throw something on the screen from one of my favorite commentators, James Montgomery Boyce, wrote, We do not have a strong church today, nor do we have many strong Christians. We can trace the cause to an acute lack of sound spiritual knowledge. You've heard me say stuff like that over and over and over again over the years. They have forgotten what God is like and what he promises to do for those who trust him. Ask an average Christian to talk about God. After getting past the expected answers, you will find that his God is a little God of vacillating sentiments. Now, if you ever wonder why I do Bible exposition, this is why I do it. If you ever wonder why always a Bible study, every time I come to church, you guys got to spend a long time doing a Bible study. This is why. I don't want anyone who comes here to ever be spiritually illiterate. I want you to be the best loved and best fed congregation in this state. And uh, frankly, I, I am scared because I know what the Bible says about the last time. It's funny how a lot of us get so into end times, last days. We're in the last days. Good. Hallelujah. But understand what comes along with the last days. Deception comes along with the last days. That's part of the promise of Scripture. Second Timothy, Paul says, the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. That's last days. But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers and will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. You want to know the truth? If the average church cut out time from the sermon and played more music and sang more songs, most people would be okay with that. If the average church took away exposition, and I'm of the opinion that most churches already have taken away exposition, and if they replaced it with exhortation, people would be okay with that. Jeremiah chapter 5, God says to the prophet, an astonishing and horrible thing has been committed in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely, and the priests rule by their own power, and my people love to have it so. Here's a case in point. In the year 1636, not that I expect any of you here to remember what that year was like, but let me tell you, in 1636, that was just 16 years after the Pilgrim Fathers landed at Plymouth Rock. They decided, 16 years later, we need a school. We need to educate preachers, clergymen, for the gospel's sake. And they decided to name the school after one of their best-known young preachers by the name of John Harvard. And Harvard University was founded, and the founding fathers stated their purpose. After God had carried us safe to New England, and we had builded our houses. I love the way they talked back then. We builded our houses, provided necessaries for our livelihood, reared convenient places for God's worship, and settled the civil government. One of the next things we longed for and looked after was to advance learning 
and perpetuate it to posterity. We want our kids and grandkids to grow up smart, dreading, listen to this, dreading to leave an illiterate ministry to the churches when our present ministers shall lie in the dust. Well, good and bad. Yes, Harvard University uh, didn't leave an illiterate ministry, but they did leave an unbiblical ministry years later. If you look at Harvard University and their school of theology now, they are so far to the left and have denied most every central truth of the Christian faith. So this is what kept Paul up at night. He could see that this was a possibility. I, got, I want you guys to know, understand, believe the truth about Jesus. So believe is his first directive. Second one, behave. Don't just believe, but behave. Let your activity catch up with your mind. Verse 6, as you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord. How many here have received Christ Jesus as Lord and Savior? Okay, good. You're the ones that are saved. If you have received Christ as Lord, you are saved. So, as you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, here it is, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. His first concern is that they know. His second concern is that they grow. That they know the truth, but that they grow in their trust of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he uses the term walk. We've already looked at this once before in this letter. As you have therefore received Christ Jesus as Lord, so walk in him. What does it mean to walk in Christ? That's your lifestyle. That's what you do every day of, of your life. A walk is a biblical term for your lifestyle, how you conduct your life. It's the consistent conduct over an entire lifetime. It's how you live your life. That's your walk. He already used this word in chapter 1, verse 10, when he said, I pray that you might walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him. He will use it again in chapter 3, verse 6. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming on the sons of disobedience, in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. You used to have a lifestyle as an unbeliever of an unsaved person. And he will use the word again in chapter 4, verse 5. Walk in wisdom toward those who are outside. That's the unbelieving world. Be very wise around unbelievers. That's the walk of the believer. Now, the idea here for walk in him is simply this. Continue to believe the truth about Jesus Christ. Don't stop believing the truth about Jesus. And let the truth of Jesus affect every part of your life. That's your walk. Let it affect every part of your life. This is what breaks a pastor's heart. This is what keeps a pastor up at night. Is, is he thinks about people that once were vibrant in their faith, they were growing in their faith, growing in their experience, they were very involved, they were so excited to follow Jesus, they're not here anymore. They're gone. Hey, we're so-and-so. I haven't seen that person in a long time. And you find out, well, they stopped coming to church. They stopped reading their Bible. They stopped hanging out with other believers. They stopped praying. They just stopped. They just stopped. So we, we can't stop. We have to make progress. We have to continue to walk. Now, I'm going to drill down in verse 6 and 7 for just a moment. Because what I find here is that Paul tells us there are three things we need to do in order to have a healthy walk. Number one, and I'll give you the principle, and then I'll show you, show you the text. Number one, keep moving forward so that you don't slip backwards. Keep moving forward so that you don't slip backward. That's verse six. As you have received Christ the Lord, as Lord, so walk in him. That is in the present tense. 
In other words, okay, you once received Christ, awesome, we're glad that you got saved, whatever day you did, but now walk in him. Continue constantly, daily, walk in him. Don't stop. Keep moving forward so you don't slip backward. Charles Haddon Spurgeon put it this way, the Christian life is like climbing a hill of ice. You can't slide up. Makes sense, right? Any, any of you ever hear about somebody upsliding? What happened to that Christian? Oh, man, he upslid. No, we say he backslid. Nobody upslides. He says, if you want to know how to backslide, stop going forward. Cease going upward, and you'll go downward of necessity. You can never stand still. Maybe we should even say it this way. Maybe we should say, if you're not going forward, then you actually are going backward. This is why we talk about next step cards. And we don't just have next step cards because we like to print stuff on paper. Let's just print stuff up because churches do that. No, we believe that every single one of us, self-included, have a next step to take. Have we can never plateau and say, been there, done that, got the t-shirt, I'm a Christian, I'm mature. All of us need a walk. So keep moving forward so you don't slip backward. That's, that's number one. Number two, grow down so you can grow up. This is all under the banner of behave. Grow down so you can grow up. Look at verse seven. Rooted, that's downward growth, and built up in him. That's upward growth. Rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as you have been taught. So grow down so you can grow up. Or I'll put it another way. Go for depth. Not breadth. Go for depth. Get a root system. Get a root system in your Christian life. A tree has to grow down before it can ever grow up. A tree has to develop a root system before it can ever have branches and leaves and fruit. So good fruit depends on a good root. Good fruit depends on good root. I learned years ago that I need to, the Lord told me this, focus on the depth of your ministry and let me take care of the breadth of your ministry. So at the, this last service, the first service this morning, I met a family. They were sitting right over in this section, and they came. They came all the way across the country from Kansas City and Savannah, Georgia, just to be a part of this church service. Uh, this gal turned 70 years of age. She had a brain tumor this last year. A kid said, what do you want for your birthday? You want to go to Hawaii? She says, I want to go to Albuquerque, and I want to sit in that church because I'm a part of that church online. That's my birthday wish. Came all the way across the country. Now, I didn't years ago think, how can, how can I get that to happen? How can I get people to do that? Just worry about the depth, and God will take care of the breadth. So get a root system. Christians are not to be tumbleweeds. And you know, we know a lot about tumbleweeds around these parts, right? Some of us even decorate them for Christmas, I noticed. Tumbleweeds really have no root system. That's why they blow around everywhere. So I discovered that tumbleweeds, get this, have a single narrow root that turns brittle with age. Sounds like some people I know. <laughs> Very narrow, and they grow brittle with age. That's not, that's not how you want to live your Christian life because a tumbleweed, um, because they have a limited root system, it's why they have a short life. It's why they blow around with every wind of doctrine. So a fruitful Christian has roots. Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Stay connected to him, stay abiding in him. At all times, you will grow. So keep moving forward so you don't slip backward. Grow down so you can grow up. And the third part of behaving is this. Thinking should lead to thanking. Thinking 
should lead to thinking. After all this great theology and after all this knowledge and stuff that he gives and throws down, he says at the end of verse 7, abounding in it with thanksgiving. That is the effect of a good theology. If you are down in the mouth and always pessimistic and always bummed out, I'm guessing there's something you don't understand. There's something lacking in your theological construct because the mark of maturity a healthy Christian spills out with gratitude. Paul the Apostle, the guy who was in jail a lot, got beat up a lot, is the guy who said in 1 Thessalonians 5, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Not in everything complain, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you, but in everything give thanks. So believe, behave, And then finally, the third word is beware. And he says that. Look at verse 8. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him, that is in Jesus Christ, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him, who is the head of all principality, power. You notice he uses the word philosophy. I like the word. I took philosophy for a master's degree program years ago. Studied all sorts of different philosophical constructs and, and really got to understand how utterly confused these people are. And here's unregenerate man trying to figure out life and not doing a really great job out of it except noticing certain things and writing them down and disagreeing with that dude and So the word philosophy, I actually like the word. It comes from two Greek words, phileo, which is to love, and sophia, which is wisdom, or the right application of knowledge. It simply means somebody who loves or pursues knowledge or wisdom, philosophy. In one sense, every one of us is a philosopher because we all have a worldview. Everybody grapples with the question, why am I here? What is the purpose and meaning of life? But Paul uses the word here, philosophy, not in reference to loving wisdom and loving knowledge and college courses on philosophy. Paul uses the term philosophy to mean this. Man's attempt to find out by his own intellect and research those things which can only be known by divine revelation. That's what he means. Man's attempt to find out by his own intellect and research those things which can only be known by divine revelation. Well, who was doing that in Colossae? That group we've been telling you about every week, that group of heretics, that group of people that were talking smack about Jesus and making up stories about Jesus and and infiltrating the church. They became known as Gnostics later on. They became known as Serinthian Gnostics and Docetic Gnostics. I'm not going to take the time to explain that today. But here's what I want you to understand about these people. They used familiar words, familiar Christian words, with different meanings of those words. So they had the same vocabulary, but they happened to have a different dictionary. So they said God and Jesus, and those Christians go, I know about God and I know about Jesus. But the meaning poured into God and Jesus was from a different dictionary. It meant something completely different. So the label was not accurate as to the contents. Years ago, when Gerber baby food started marketing its baby food in Africa, the continent of Africa, they they made a fatal mistake in packaging because they packaged uh, their product like they would package it in the United States. If you pick up a baby food jar from Gerber's, what's on the front of it? A baby, a cute little baby, right? Um, That's what sells it here. But in Africa, there are many countries where the illiteracy rate is very high, so they don't read. So companies in Africa typically will put on the label the contents of whatever is in the product, in the jar. 
So for somebody in Africa to see a baby on the front of a jar, it's like, I'm not touching that jar. <laughs> if that's what's in it. So it was a, they just, they didn't, they didn't do well. They didn't do well in, in, in Africa. A um, few years after that, the Pepsi-Cola company uh, was marketing in China, and their slogan on their product, on their can, was this. Pepsi brings you back to life. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. That's a good slogan, right? Gives you a little pickup. We know what that means. Pepsi brings you back to life. However, in the translation, something was lost. And it came out this way in Chinese. Pepsi brings your ancestors back from the grave. <laughs> yeah, did they do well? No, they didn't do well. So these are innocent mistakes. Um, there's no babies in jars. There's no ancestors that come back from the grave. But my point is this. Heretics words are like putting wrong labels on jars. They're putting wrong labels. Same vocabulary, different dictionary. Wrong information. Wrong information. And cults are notorious for doing this. This is why people get confused. We have conversation with cultists, people involved in, in errant belief systems, and we go, well, they, they, they say they love Jesus, and they're, they say they're born again. Drill down deeper and find out what they mean by born again and what they mean by Jesus. Chances are it's not the same thing you mean, and especially what the Bible means by Jesus. Go beyond just the labeling. Find out the definition. So he says, beware. That's the warning. Lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit. The word cheat is sometimes translated, if you have an NIV, take you captive. Don't let anybody take you captive. A better translation is, don't let anyone kidnap your faith. These heretics were nothing more than spiritual human traffickers. They were kidnapping people's faith. They were coming into congregations, and they were finding young, impressionable believers and taking them aside and trying to push their stuff on them. And Paul warned about that, not only here, but he warned about that in so many other places. Church of Ephesus, Paul spent three years in Ephesus. When he's leaving that town, he said, this is Acts 20, after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Men will arise from your own ranks to draw away disciples after themselves. Almost every person I've talked to who's been involved in some kind of cult, many of them, most of them, were at one time in solid Christian churches. Solid Christian churches. But somebody got on their ear and drew them away. And it's not just people who would come into a congregation by subterfuge and do that. Sadly, pulpits are weak. And when pulpits are weak and ministers are off the wall, there's little hope for anybody who would listen to them. Um, a magazine survey of over 3,000 Protestant ministers revealed that a considerable number of them rejected altogether the idea of a personal God. So why are you even in the pulpit, Mr. Preacher, if you don't believe in a personal God? God, they said, was the ground of being, listen to these terms, the force of life, may the force be with you, the principle of love. 56% rejected the virgin birth of Jesus Christ, foundational principle of Scripture. 71%, these are ministers, rejected the idea of life after death. Again, what are you even... Work somewhere else. 54% rejected the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ, and a large majority in the 90 percentile rejected the idea that there would be a personal return of Jesus Christ to the earth. So what does Paul have to say about stuff like that? Verse 9 is what Paul has to say. I love his answer. Verse 9, for in him, in Christ, in Christ, dwells, means permanently dwells. 
It, it actually means settle down and make itself at home in. In Christ dwells permanently all the fullness of the Godhead in bodily form, or the Godhead bodily. Now that verse, verse 9, if, if it's not marked in your Bible, and you don't mind marking your Bible, any of you guys mind, is it okay to mark your Bible? Mark that verse. It is perhaps the clearest verse of the deity of Jesus Christ in Scripture, if not the, one of the most clear, solid um, places where the deity of Christ is shown. It shatters arguments. It was effective against the Gnosticism of Paul's day that denied the deity of Christ. I'll pull this verse out. If you uh, speak to somebody who's involved in uh, Christian science or they're a Jehovah Witness or they belong to the Unity School or the uh, Theosophy Movement or Mormonism or Unity School of Christianity, all of these that deny the deity of Christ, show that one. In Jesus Christ dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Okay, in that verse, there's a word, fullness. See the word fullness? That happened to be a buzzword for the Gnostics, for the heretics. They love this word fullness. And this is what they said. They said, the fullness of God was divided up. The pleroma, that's what the word fullness means, or that's the Greek word. The divine pleroma, the fullness, is divided up in its expression among the various emanations that came from God. So remember I said there's all these little sub-gods, angelic beings that came out from God. Jesus was one of them. The pleroma, the fullness of God, was divided in all those different emanations, all those beings, and it decreased the further down the ladder they got. And Paul knew that. He knew that they were teaching that. What Paul is saying this, uh, Jesus did not get part of it. He got all of it. All of it. The fullness of the Godhead dwells in Jesus Christ. It was a solid frontal blow to that heresy of the time. But let's close where he closes the paragraph. This is, to me, the most personal part. Verse 10. And you are complete in him. You are complete in him. Gnostics said you're not complete in him. Jesus is a good start. It's a good place to start. We're going to take you into the deeper knowledge, the fullness, the pleroma of God, to all these little steps and philosophies and legalistic practices. Paul's going, uh-uh. Jesus, if Jesus is all you've got, it's because Jesus is all you need. In him is the fullness of God. And, and by the way, verse 10, you are complete in him. Same word, play Roma. Fullness of God is in Jesus. Jesus made you complete. He completed your life who is the head of all principality and power. So, what kept Paul the Apostle up at night? Huh. What kept him up were two things. Number one, the Christians in Colossae who were complete in Jesus, but they didn't think they were complete. And number two, unbelievers, who because they were unbelievers, were indeed not complete. All human beings are incomplete without Christ. I have Jewish friends who have given their lives to Jesus, and they have an interesting way of describing their life. They say, I am a completed Jew, their, their terminology. I go, what do you mean a completed Jew? He goes, well, you know, Judaism always anticipated Messiah. We sort of set the groundwork for y'all. And so uh, um, that's my heritage, Jewish. But now I've met the Messiah, met Jesus, I am a completed Jew. And I think it's a good description because human beings are incomplete until they come to Christ. Jesus makes you complete. You are complete in him. So, if you're not a believer this morning, if you haven't 
personally received the Lord Jesus, let alone walk in him. You just not, not haven't received him personally. You may be religious, may be a good person, but you haven't personally come to a place where you said, I am giving my life to Jesus. Now is the time for you to rest your life on the pillow of God's grace and be complete in him. And if you are a believer this morning and somebody's saying, yeah, well, I'm glad you're a Christian, but you know, you, you need this and you need that. Listen, you are complete in Jesus Christ. You need to hear that message. You're complete in him. Now, it could be that you don't know what you have. There's a lot of people who uh, sort of live like um, they're actually millionaires in the bank, but uh, they feel like they need a second, third income stream. Uh, even though they've got everything they need, it's in the bank. Just go find out what you have in the bank and use what you got. There's a lot of us believers who are spiritually wealthy, but we just don't know what we have in the bank. That's why we read the scripture all the time, to discover what's in the bank book. But you are complete in him. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the word of God. Thank you for the complete work of Jesus Christ on our behalf. Nothing can be added to it. Uh, Jesus said on the cross, it is finished. We believe that it is finished indeed. And Father, I pray for um, every, every believer here, first of all, this morning. I pray that every, every believer, every child of God who is feeling inadequate, who is feeling isolated, who is feeling like they haven't uh, met up or matched up or been enough or need more, I pray, Lord, that you would just reveal to them day by day and week by week, just how rich, how wealthy they are because they are in Christ and Christ is in them. And I pray, Lord, that they would discover how complete, how full you have made them positionally before God, but then would you make it experientially the same? Would you give them the experience of completion and fullness in their daily life, a fullness of joy, fullness of satisfaction, a fullness of thanksgiving. Would you do that for your people, Lord? We pray you would. And we pray, Lord, that we would put these things into our walk, our practice, that they might be a reality. And then, Father, I pray for those who may be with us this morning, but they have never made that all-important first step of saying to Jesus, be my Lord, be my Savior. I'm giving my life to you. I'm beginning my Christian life by receiving the Savior as my Savior, not just the Savior of the world, but my personal Lord and Savior. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Before we close this service this morning, is there anyone here who hasn't done that yet that has personally received Jesus as Savior, asking him to forgive them of their sins. Have you, have you not done that yet? Or is there anyone perhaps who is here who is not walking with him? Maybe at one time you were, but you stopped. You walked away. You're not living a life of obedience. You just need to come back home, get back on track. That describes anyone here if either of those two descriptions describe you and you are you are willing to change and give your life to christ this morning would you just raise your hand up as we close the service raise it up and keep it up for a moment so i can acknowledge you i see a couple hands right there in the middle yes sir god bless you in the back just raise your hand up so i can acknowledge you off to my right a couple hands over here awesome you guys that's just honesty we're just getting real uh, before each other and before God. You know, think of somebody in the water, they're drowning and they reach their hand up and say, God, help. God bless you in the way back. Anybody in the family room? Anyone outside in the courtyard? Raise your hand up. There's a pastor there. Anyone in the balcony? Awesome, awesome. Thank you, Father, for these. There's just a whole bunch of people that have just come to the realization that they need to rest in you and completely lay their lives 
on the completed work of Jesus Christ and be complete in him. Doesn't get any better than this. Thank you, Father, for them. Strengthen the decision that they are making at this moment in Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand to our feet. As we sing this final song, I'm gonna ask those of you to, who raised your hand, and I saw somebody way in the back, somebody in the balcony, some off to the side in the middle. I'm gonna ask you to get up from where you're standing, find the nearest aisle, walk down the aisle, come up to the front. I'm gonna lead you in a prayer when you get here to, to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. We're gonna do this deal right now. So if you raise your hand, please come this way and allow us the opportunity to love on you and congratulate you. Yes, yeah, come on. Come all the way up front. Welcome. Good thinking. Yeah. Awesome, awesome. Come on up. God bless you girls. How you doing? Nice to see you. Thanks for coming. God bless you. If you're in the balcony, just come down the stairs. If you're uh, in the middle of a row and it seems a little awkward because there's so many people, trust me, we, we know this routine. If you're in the middle of an aisle and you were to say, excuse me, you're going to watch that row part like the Red Sea. Uh, we are so accommodating to people who are making decisions like this. Uh, we'll even applaud you as you come or stand with you as you come. Come right up to the front. Come right up to the front. Thank you, Lord. If you're outside and you raise your hand, a pastor will walk you inside, so we'll just give it a few moments. But again, um, let me just encourage you that you don't just raise a hand and let me acknowledge you. I think it's important that you, like we said in the Word, you walk. You actually walk forward because Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father who is in heaven. If you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father and all the holy angels. So this is an opportunity to just come clean, come out of the closet as a Christian, say, I'm gonna follow Jesus in public, on purpose, I'm all in, I'm giving my life to Jesus. Anyone else will give you that opportunity. Step up. All right, you guys, come on up. Come on up. Way to go. I'm gonna lead those of you who have walked forward, I'm gonna lead you now in a prayer. I want you to pray this prayer out loud after me. You say these words, to the living God who is listening to you right now and is so willing to receive you. So say this, Lord, I give you my life. I know that I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. I believe in Jesus. I believe he died on the cross. I believe he rose again. I turn from my sin. I repent of it. I turn my life to Jesus, to follow him, to obey him. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Help me to live for you, in Jesus' name. Amen, 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 amen. Thank you so much for joining us for this message from Calvary Church. We would love to know how this message impacted you. Share your story with us. Email mystory at calvarynm.church. And if you'd like to support this Bible teaching ministry with a financial gift, visit calvarynm.church give.